This is computer organization and architecture. Uh, we begin this series of uh, lectures by uh, revising the logic design basics in the previous video. And today we will discuss the first chapter, which will talk about computer abstractions and technology. Uh, first, we need to answer this question, why we are studying computer architecture. It's actually embarrassing if you have a bachelor degree in computer and you couldn't make sense of the following terms, DRAM, pipelining, cache hierarchies, input and output, virtual memories. There are many other terminologies as well. It's also embarrassing if you have a degree in computers and you can't decide which processor to buy. For example, a three gigahertz Pentium 4, it's an old processor, or 2.5 gigahertz Atom. Uh, this course will help us reason about performance and power as a, an obvious first step for chip designer, you should have some knowledge about computer architecture. Also, when you're trying to write a piece of code that do something uh, inside the compiler or the operating system, you need to know how the hardware is going to react. So uh, the knowledge of hardware will help you actually write better programs in case you are wondering. If you are asked, must a programmer care about hardware? The uh, quick answer is yes. You must know how to reason about program performance and energy. So some of the things that you should worry about is the memory management. If, if we understand how or where data is placed or located inside the memory, we can help ensure that re uh, relevant data is nearby and this way we access it quickly. Also, when you are trying to do thread management, if we understand how the threads interact, we can write smart multi-threaded program, especially if we know how the hardware react to uh, different threads. Why do we care about multi-threaded programs? Uh, as a short answer to this question, uh, nowadays we should think about parallel programming. And one of the ideas that parallel programming uh, makes uh, uh, our life easy by uh, executing processes uh, in a fast way. So, uh, we should build programs that could run using uh, multi threads if we are managed to uh, organize the software and the hardware in such a way to make threads process faster that will benefit uh, us by executing job jobs quickly In the introdu introduction part, we will talk first about the computer revolution. We have progress in computer technology. It's actually following Moore's law to a certain point. It makes novel applications feasible because now you can see computers in cars, automobiles, uh, in cell phones, uh, in uh, hum human, genome projects and the internet 
in the search engines and in many other applications like the embedded systems and basically any uh, smart device that we can uh, check today, it must have uh, uh, certain computer architectures inside it. And we should be able to uh, have some knowledge about those different uh, systems. Computers are uh, pervasive, spreading widely in several fields. Uh, here are the classes of computers. We have the personal computers, server computers, supercomputers, and we have embedded computers. The personal computers, they are general purpose with a variety of softwares. We call them in short PCs or B. PC. Uh, it's subject to cost performance trade off. Usually, the more performance you are seeking in a PC, the more money that you need to pay. Uh, in the server computers, it's actually network based. It has high capacity performance. It's also more reliable. And it ranges from small servers to building size. The supercomputers, they are uh, uh, a high-end, uh, state-of-the-art scientific and in, uh, for scientific and engineering uh, calculation. Uh, it's highest, uh, it has the highest capability, but represents a small fraction of the overall computer market. The embedded computers, this is widely used right now. It's usually embedded or hidden inside a system as a, a one component. Uh, uh, it uh, uh, has also trade-offs in power performance and cost. And sometimes it, uh, it becomes a uh, sort of constraints. Yeah, if uh, you are sitting in a room right now or in a car, uh, you could uh, count so many embedded computers around you uh, in the ACs, in the TVs, in the keyboard, in the screens, in the uh, cell phones, even in the remote controls, uh, in, in even uh, some of the toys and computer games, they all include embedded computers. Some of them have specialized functionality, small and very cheap. Some of them are uh, uh, like having uh, uh, good performance, uh, many features and capabilities, and usually they are pricey and there are shades in between. Uh, this uh, graph, you in this graph you see the processor market. We are comparing the cell phones, the personal computers, and the TVs since 1997. Uh, beginning from this year up to 2007. And you can see the trends. You can see, for example, in the personal computer, uh, it's increasing. And the trends, is, as you can see, it's going up little by little up to 2007. For the TVs, uh, the, it has uh, uh, this increase. Uh, we recorded for 2004, 5, 6, and 7. But you can see the cell phone market is increasing in an exponential way throughout the years. And we are expecting this trend to continue up to this year.
So it's good to focus on the computers inside the cell phones, the cell phones more than VCs or laptops. Uh, th that was the processor market uh, since the, the nearest or the nearest recording of those comparison was in 2007. Uh, the post BC era includes tablets, smartphones, uh, personal computers that doesn't include the tablets because we have it here and the cell phones that doesn't include uh, smart processors. So basically these are the old mobile phones while this one is the new smart phones. And we had the comparison uh, beginning from 2007 to 2012. And what we are recording here are the number of sales. As you can see, uh, the cell phones, the old cell phones, this is the care for them. It's uh, not that uh, high. Uh, it's interesting to see the relation between the BC and the smartphones. The BC has more sales that, uh, in uh, before about the mid of 2010. And at that point, the smartphones sells much more than the PC. But if you can see the tablet, it has a category by itself. It's fluctuating, but it has very high sales because, because of this, you can think up to this year, 2012, uh, tablets has, or the tablets have won the market. It sells more than anything else. Uh, of course, with time, the, the differentiation between tablets and smartphones uh, becomes uh, uh, ambiguous a little bit, so it's hard to uh, take them apart. Now, we have in the post VC era the personal mobile device or the BMD. It's battery operated, connects it connects to the internet. Uh, its price is hundreds of dollars. Right now, it's moving to thousands, probably one thousand or something like this. Uh, the, it's uh, including smartphones, tablets, and electronic glasses, for example, uh, electronic, uh, electronic, uh, some of the electronic watches, and so on. We also have the cloud computing. Uh, which is a, a warehouse scale computer, WSC. Uh, it's uh, providing software as a service or SaaS. A portion of uh, software run on uh, a BMD and some portion runs in the cloud. And with time, more of the executions uh, or the, uh, the, uh, the uh, code execution happens in the cloud and uh, very little happens in the uh, smartphones. Uh, some of the leading uh, companies that use cloud computing are Amazon and Google. And you can look it up in the internet to see what are their platform and how to use it. What you will learn in this uh, class is how programs are translated into the machine language. So we are giving you a building block that uh, give you knowledge how to uh, how the programs work from the software level down to uh, the hardware. Also, you will gain knowledge about processors, about uh, memories, about uh, uh, computer arithmetics and uh, uh, more more things that we'll see uh, in the coming of uh, uh, videos. So that's the first thing that we are going to check how programs are translated into the machine language and how the hardware execute them. Uh, we will check the hardware software interface, uh, which is the uh, uh, area between the software and the hardware. 
what determines program performance and this is very important metric that we will check this way if we have two machines machine a and machine b we can know which one is better in terms of performance and then we will see some of the ideas to improve the performance uh, such as, such as uh, process of pipelining. Uh, also, we will check how hardware designers improve the performance. And uh, if we have uh, uh, the idea of uh, parallel process, processing understood, that will give you good knowledge regarding computer architecture. So, Understanding performance is very critical. The performance of a program depends actually in, on many factors, both hardware and the soft and software. Algorithm is very important. It, had, it has direct impact, impact on performance. And this is why we write our algorithm in a very efficient way. And uh, this is why understanding algorithm complexity, which is what's uh, uh, the uh, 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 algorithmic uh, uh, or the algorithm developers called big O notation. So you want programs that have less big O complexity. You are actually, what you're doing here, you are determined, you're trying to determine the number of operation executed to, to do a certain job in an algorithm. We, the programming language, the compiler, and the architecture is also very critical in uh, having a better performance. You determine the number of machine instruction this way. What are the number of machine instruction executed per operation? Using a certain language might have less a number of instructions while another one have more uh, number of, of instructions uh, they this also the compiler have direct impact on that and the architecture itself also we will have uh, uh, the processor and the memory system which are one the, the two main components in any uh, hardware architecture and of course, they will have direct impact on performance. This determines how fast the instructions are executed. So you can see that we always worry about operations or instructions. How many operations, uh, how many instructions, and how fast you can execute those instructions based on algorithm programming language, compiler architecture, and also processor and memory. The I.O. system, including the operating system, determine also how fast the I.O. Uh, operations are executed. There are eight great ideas uh, in computer architectures that you should keep in mind when you are designing a hardware or you're trying to uh, improve uh, a current hardware that you have in your hand. Those eight you should memorize. First one is design for more slow. We care about more slow and we will check it in the coming of slide. Basically, more slow says that every technology generation uh, in every one of them uh, you will have about double the number of transistors so you have more processing power in each coming generation so you should keep this in your mind there are other uh, related aspects of Moore's law that we will check as well uh, second use abstraction to simplify Design. Abstraction is very important to not get stuck with detail. Like for example, this picture, you know that this is a fist, that's enough. At that point in the design, you use abstraction to make it simple. 
The third one is making the common case first. So if you have something repetitive, all the time you are facing that, or you have a certain instruction that you always see in your code, make it as fast as you can. So focus on the common cases, make them fast. If there are like special cases that doesn't repeat much, you can sacrifice them. The three points after this is related to performance. You do the performance via uh, parallelism. We are taking the picture of the airplane because you can send a lot of passengers in one at one time. Uh, performance uh, via pipelining. The idea of pipelining we will discuss in detail when we talk about the uh, processor and the performance via prediction. Uh, it's good sometimes to predict the outcome of a certain instruction before it finishes its execution. If your prediction is correct, will make the execution of your program faster. And uh, uh, the hierarchy of memories, we know that the memories starting from uh, the uh, storage element close to the CPU, we have the registers. After that, we have level one cache, and then level two cache, level three cache, and then after that, we have the main memory. So the register would be in the beak of the uh, triangle or the pyramid going down. You will have the main memory at the end, and there are also other levels after that. And the uh, the uh, register on the top of the pyramid is really fast, but it has very limited space. The, uh, uh, the main memory, if we say that it's the lower uh, 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 storage element in, in this uh, hierarchy, then the main memory uh, will be the slowest. However, it will have the largest space. So we get the, this hierarchy to get the best of both worlds. We have a lot of space and at the same as fast as possible, at the same time. Now, the last one is dependability uh, via redundancy. You can see it here in this uh, picture. We have the truck. So we make sure it's the system is dependable via a redundancy. You can see, for example, if we say in the truck, you can uh, carry many of the same systems. So if uh, one of them is uh, go, uh, one of them went faulty, the others will still be working. Also, if you're thinking about the tires, some of the tires uh, are used as backup. So if one of the tires blown out or has in, have, have bad performance, you can replace it with the other one. So you have the redundancy, of which is like another system of the same type that you are keeping it as a backup. You are increasing the dependability by having more redundant systems. Now, below your program, so, we want to see the relation between the software and hardware by understanding that you have first application softwares. There are so many application examples. Under that, we have the system software, which is basically composed of the operating system and the combine. The comp compiler uh, trans translates the uh, a high level language code into machine codes. Uh, the operating system is uh, actually a surface code uh, to manage the different applications and making sure they are using the hardware resources in an efficient way. So they handle the input and the output. They manage the memory and the storage. They also, the operating system is going to be responsible for scheduling tasks and sharing the resources. And at the bottom, we have the hardware, which is composed of the three main uh, 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 
items. The first one is the processor. The second is the memory. And the third is the I-O controllers or the input-output controllers. Now, the forces that has an effect on computer architecture, there are actually many. The operating system affects the computer architecture. The applications themselves affect the computer architecture. The technology following Moore's row, it affects also the computer architecture. Programming language, like programming in C or Java or uh, any other language like Python or machine learning and AI, and, and there are so many examples. They have also a, a direct effect in the computer architecture. So you should choose the right programming language for your need. The organizational techniques as well, uh, different techniques to manage the memory, to manage the processor and the I.O. So they have direct uh, uh, force upon the computer architecture. Also, the history plays an important role uh, in the computer architecture. At some point of time, they have a certain technique. It stays for a while, like let's say a, a decade because of history. And after that, we found a better solution and so on. And this is actually related to the uh, researches and the current state of the art methodologies that uh, di the, the direct their attention to a certain aspect of computer architecture. Now, what is computer architecture? You can see if we see those levels in the top, they are the software and the levels in the bottom are the hardware. We have in the software, the application. This is an example. Also the operating system. We have also these as examples. And the operating system, we also have the compiler and the assembler as the software components. And below that, we have this big rectangular. This rectangle is the instruction set architecture, or in short, we call it ISA. So we have set of instructions that uh, that any, uh, or actually any high level programming language, the compiler will uh, translate them to an assembly uh, language, and the assembler will con uh, uh, convert this assembly language into a machine code that can run in the processor and memory and the input and output system. You can, uh, in the assembly language, we have set of our uh, uh, instructions. So we have, let's say, uh, a thousand instructions with their different uh, uh, versions. Some of them have two inputs, some of them have a single output, some of them have two outputs or can manage three inputs. There are so many instructions that architecture for so many different processors. We would see with the coming of days that if, if you make the instruction set architecture, which is the set of instruction, as simple as you can, this will help you build a faster and more efficient system. So we have the instruction set architecture as the uh, area between the software and the hardware. It has instruction that can run, uh, instructions that can run directly in the hardware, meaning the processor, dealing with processor, memory, and I.O. system. Now, under that, we have the data path and control. Uh, as a quick example, the multiplexer is a very nice example. In the multiplexer, let me draw it in a nice way. So the multiplexer or we call it a MUX. Usually as an easy example, we have if we have two uh, inputs and one output, we have also a control line right here. So this control line that select between the inputs is part of the control. 
while the data being at the input and moving to the output, this is the data path. The data path. Now, the data path and the control is hardware, as you can see, the multiplexer is a hardware. The processor, the memory, and the I.O. system are built using database, that, that data path and control. Those two together, we call them the machine organization, the machine organization. And those parts, three parts together, the instruction set, the processor, the memory, the I.O., different techniques in the data path and the control, this is the main parts of the computer architecture. Now, below the, that, this is what we looked at in the, our revision, the digital design, the circuit design, and things like that. This is the, uh, you can take it in a digital uh, uh, logic design course in the digital design, or also you can go below to the circuit design. And at the end here, we have the transistor and the uh, IC layout, the integrated circuit layout, layout. And this is uh, usually part of a, a course related to very large scale uh, integration or in short PLSI, uh, which is outside of the scope of the architecture. This is a very simple equation. If you were to define what's a computer architecture, then the computer ar architecture is the equivalent of the instruction set architecture plus the machine organization. Now, uh, this is a, a detailed view of the levels of program code. So we high, have a high level language, uh, such as C language. This is a code to swap uh, the members of an array. Uh, so this code have a level of abstraction closer to the problem domain. Uh, you can also read it uh, and quite understand what's going on. So you have V of K and you have V of K plus one. And what you want, you want to swap those two variables. So you use a temporary value. And there are many ways to solve this problem. One way is to put the value of VK in the temporary value first, which is the first step here, and then put the VK plus one in VK, and that's the second stage. And after that, you take whatever you put in the temporary value and put it in VK plus one, which is the third stage, and it's listed in those three statements. So you think about the problem, probably write a pseudo code for it, and then translate it to a high level, uh, language after understanding the algorithm and trying to get the complexity of the program to the lowest possible. Uh, you use high level language, and that's one example. You could use C. Another example is uh, Java, uh, maybe Python as well. Uh, so you write using a high level language. Uh, you worry about productivity and portability when you use high level language, uh, productivity meaning that you can write uh, longer programs that do many uh, jobs or uh, uh, translate trans uh, certain features uh, of uh, an, an application. Uh, also, you worry about portability. If you write a high level uh, a program in high level language, in a certain using a certain PC or laptop. If you go to another PC or you want to check it with another friend of yours, you can do that without any problem because it's going to be portable. After that, we have the assembly language, which is a textual representation of instructions that's very close to the hardware. So the job actually of the compiler is to translate this code into assembly language. This is the assembly language that we are going to study in this course. It's called MIPS, assembly language. You can see here that we have 
different instructions. Uh, this is a, a multiplication instruction. This is addition instruction. This is loading variable in a certain memory location. You load it into registers. You can see the uh, numbers here that is beginning with dollar sign, dollar sign, and after that we have a number. These are the register numbers. So we have register number two, register number five, register number 15, 16, and so on, and register number 31, 31 and so on. So you have load instruction to load from the memory. We have store instruction to store into the memory, and we have a, a jump instruction. It's actually jump return meaning that after you finish the swap method or the swap function, you jump back to whoever called uh, the swap uh, function. So you can see that uh, uh, this is not readable as the high-level language. The high-level language, you can understand it if you spend a few minutes. But this one, you need good knowledge about instructions, how to write them, what does this server, the, the, this uh, syntax mean and things like this. Uh, this is the job of the compiler actually to convert from the high level language to the assembly language. But we are going to describe the assembly language program for you. Uh, this way, if you look at an assembly uh, code, you could uh, have some inference about it. You could understand it, uh, especially uh, if you are worrying, for example, let's say uh, you are uh, a cybersecurity major and you are worrying about uh, viruses, uh, Trojan horses, and things like this. Uh, if you go down to the assembly language level and you have good knowledge about it, you can catch those problems and fix them easily. Uh, the hardware representation. Uh, this is uh, the uh, actually the assembler job after this is to translate the assembly language into machine code where each instruction, there is a one-to-one -one mapping. If you can see here, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven instruction. We are supposed to have also seven uh, binary machine uh, codes for each instruction. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. If you check and you count the number of zeros and one for each one of them, you would find that it is going to be 32 bits. And those details we will describe in more detail uh, in the, uh, when we talk about the assembly language in the next chapter. Now the hardware representation, it's actually binary digits, zeros and ones, which are the encoded instructions that you see here into machine code. So basically the high level language program, the compiler converted to assembly language program and the assembler converted to machine language uh, program. Now, based on the machine interpretation. Now, at this point, the machine or the hardware could understand you. Based on some uh, machine interpretation, you could uh, also have the control uh, signal uh, specification as well. But if you reach to this point, from this point to this point, that's good enough for uh, our course. Now, this big picture, uh, if you open any PC, let's say, or laptop or a smartphone, what can you see inside? There are some components for all kinds of computers. Like, let, let's look at this picture. You have the processor. You have the memory in the processor. The main two parts is the data path and the control. In the memory, you have things that are inputs to the memory and there are things that you need to save in the memory and some variables that you need to read from the memory. So the memory, you have the read operation. You have the read operation and you have the write operation. 
The read operation is the same as loading from the memory. The write operation is the same as uh, storing to the memory. We also need to, uh, the, the computer need to manage the input and the output. So we have inputs to the computer and outputs from the computer. So basically we have the processor, the first main ma or major item of the computer. The second major item is the memory and the third major item is the input and the output. Now there are interfaces that could help you with the outside world. Those interfaces could be hardware or software. Uh, uh, the software that uh, you should uh, include in a computer, for example, you will, should have an operating system, you should have a compiler, and you, have, you should have uh, an uh, evaluating metric to measure the performance of your machine, to improve it, or to compare between two different systems. So we have actually the same components for all kinds of computers, whether they are desktop, servers, embedded computers, but they have different capabilities. Uh, the input and output includes the user interface devices, meaning, for example, the display, the keyboard, the mouse. These are inputs devices. The display is an output device. Now, for example, we have the touch screen where we could uh, uh, consider an input device and also output device. We have also storage devices like the hard disk, the CD and DVD drive, the flash and so on. We can have many adapters or drivers like the network adapter or what we call the network card for communication uh, or with other computers. And we have many other components. Now, this is the anatomy of a computer. So we are trying to uh, look inside and see what's in uh, the, uh, the uh, components of a computer here. In this example, we have an output device. This is a screen. We have uh, a network cable, for example, this cable that connects uh, to the internet. Uh, we have an input device, the keyboard. We have another input device, the mouse. And we have the uh, PC itself here. Uh, if we take the mouse and we want to check what's inside, this is a quick uh, uh, a quick look at the mouse components. So we have uh, currently the optical mouse, which is ha has lid that illuminates uh, uh, light uh, into a certain area. Uh, it's a, a small, uh, 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 low uh, resistance camera. It has a basic image processor. It looks for coordinates. X and Y to know the movement of the mouse from a, a certain pixel to another pixel. Uh, it has also buttons, for example, the right click, the left click, and we. it has also wheels like this one in the middle to scroll up and down. And uh, before the optical mouse, we have a mechanical uh, a mouse that has a ball in, below it, and it, this ball rolls to know the coordinates x and y. So basically, the mouse, what it does is look for coordinates and show that to you in the uh, screen. Now, if you open the box of the BC, meaning that we open this one here. You can see the following. You can see that you have a hard drive here. We have the processor under the fan. This is usually a fan. And we have the processor under that. Uh, we have uh, the uh, spot for uh, memory, the memory. The memory, we call it DIMM. And we have modules. These are the DIMM. That's one of them. It has chips, each one of them have a size. And if you calculate uh, how many of them, it's black chips here, and you know the size of one of them, you can get the full 
uh, size of the memory. Right now we have two copies or two DIMMs. And uh, this is a spot for the battery. And uh, here we have the motherboard, you know, it's the green place here, even though the screen is gray and white, uh, white and black, uh, some uh, also have gray shades. This is supposed to be uh, green. Some of them are red right now. This is the motherboard. Uh, we have uh, sometimes two or three bands, it depends on the machine itself. This is a DVD drive. But they cannot, uh, laptops or VCs no longer have DVD drives. They have other means like connecting to the internet or uh, uh, USB uh, boards and, and the likes. Uh, now, if we take the processor, meaning that we open this fan and we took the chip a black chip, something like this, but bigger. Uh, and we try to see what's inside this chip. This is the layout. And this layout you could uh, design if you are part of a big team in one of the well-known companies. For example, here, this one for AMD, Barcelona chip, which contains four processor cores. This is core one, core two, core three, and core four. And you should have knowledge about VLSI to understand what are these components and how to design them. So you can see that uh, if we take core one, for example here, this is core one, and we try to see what's inside. You can know that this is the floating point unit. This is the instruction, level one instruction cache. This is level one data cache. So they separate the data from instruction. Uh, instruction, let's say that you are trying to load uh, some value from a certain location. So you want to go to a location in the memory get the data and load it to a certain variable. This is an instruction. It should be here in the instruction cache. Now, you know that you use the variable here that you will store the value with. This variable will be in the data cache. So we have the data cache and the instruction cache. Both of them are level one. We have uh, also level two uh, cache. Uh, here, you can see this is level two cache. It's out of the core. It's really close, but it's outside the core. This is the level two cache for this core. This is the level two cache for this core, and so on for this one. And this one is for the other core. We have also an execution unit, which is very important. It it's basically having uh, the ALU. We had an example last uh, in the last video, how to build an ALU. There will be a much more complex ALU in the execution uh, uh, unit here. We have the load and store unit that facilitates dealing with the caches. Uh, sometimes you have also certain hardware relate or tied to the caches as well. And we have a fetch and decode, fetch and decode uh, hardware, also the branching hardware over there. And we will have some sort of knowledge in, uh, uh, in the coming uh, videos about uh, uh, some of those components or the main components of the uh, processor. Uh, this is the same here, here, and also here. You can see, if you want to see the resemblance between core two, three, and four, you can see this area here is resembling this area, which resemble this area. You can see that we flipped core two, uh, upside down to generate core three. This technique is usually used in uh, VLSI uh, layout. We have a bridge between the cores. It's called the North Bridge. It depends on the processor. Here we they call it North Bridge. Uh, this for sure means that there are other bridges as well. Uh, you can see outside we have a level three cache. 
And you can see since this is the processor, this is the processor inside the processor. Inside it, we have level one cache, level two cache, and also level three cache. Also close to the execution unit and part of it, we have registers inside. And we have other things like what you can see here, certain links. Those links helps the chip deals with the outside world. Some of them are IO, some of them are fuses. And we have also uh, DDR uh, physical components over here. And there are many other com the, the components as well. Uh, basically, what we will focus on is the processor, how the execution happens. So we will find out that we need to know how to fetch instruction, how to decode them, how to execute them, how to load them and store them in the memory. And after you finish with execution, how to write the instruction or the result back inside the uh, memory as well. These are the ones that we are gonna focus, focus on the uh, coming of uh, videos. Now, uh, here is also an example of an input output device, which is the touch screen. This is a both PC device. Uh, it's uh, supersede the keyboard and the mouse. Uh, it's uh, resistive. It has resistive and capacitive uh, types where you can catch the touch of a finger. Most tablets, smartphone use capacitive type. The capacitive allows multiple touches uh, simultaneously. Uh, and that's really good advantage for the capacitive type. Uh, the LCD screen, uh, which is the main part of the touch screen, uh, it has pixels or picture elements. Uh, those pictures uh, are indicated by coordinates, X and Y. So this one, for example, X0, Y0. This one is going to be X1 and Y1 and so on. And it has many frames. In this picture, you can see that we have uh, four shown frames, and it could have many uh, different fra frames. Uh, the, it acts like mirrors, which, which it, those mirrors content uh, of frames uh, have uh, uh, buffer uh, memory. And uh, uh, those, uh, this is the idea we cut behind the touch screen. Uh, there are history behind this. The old screens called uh, CRT, and then we have LCD, and after this we have LED, and there are many technologies. And most of the technology related to screens, we got the ideas from building TVs. Because TVs precedes computers. Now, if you... Uh, open the touch screen, meaning that you have a tablet, let's say, and you open it. So you have a capacitive multi-touch LCD screen here, and we have a battery. And we have this small part is the computer board. We zoomed it in and we're showing this to you right here. And you can see that this one here is the processor. And there are so many other chips and components. And we have also the protective covers, some cables and uh, interfaces uh, to the tablet. Inside this processor, which is right now, this one is kind of old, A5 processor from Apple, as you can see. If you look inside, you can see uh, that there are similarity between what we've seen before, but it's a different architecture. Uh, the main thing here, we have an ARM core here. We have another ARM core. So this is the processor. And it has uh, two main cores. This is what I can see here. And it has processor data bath one. Processor data bath one. You can see that these are only data bath. And we have a second one as well. And the edges, we have the general purpose input and outputs. And we have USB uh, uh, boards over here. We still have the GBIO, the input and output, because you will move the uh, data to the uh, LCD screen, uh, or basically you will move it to the touch screen. 
uh, to uh, show it as an output, or you get it from the touch screen inside to the ECOM, to the processor. We also have a DDRAM uh, and or SDRAM interface. This will be connected to DDRAM or SDRAM. These are the two main types of the uh, memories. This is a DDR, SDRAM, actually. And we have other uh, components. You can uh, see here that this is uh, also related to the memory. So this is to the audio. This is to the video. And this is for the Wi-Fi and so on. So we have basically a data path that performs the operation on data, a control path that makes decisions, sequence of data path where, where the data moves. Uh, and we, I gave you the uh, example of the multiplexer. The memory also in the I.O. Uh, we have the cache memory, which is small, fast, SRAM memory. Uh, when we talked about the uh, memory, we will understand that we have many types of memories. One of the uh, famous ones are the DRAM and the SRAM. The SRAM is very expensive compared to DRAM, but it's very efficient and fast. And this is the Apple A5 processor. So you, we open two different uh, computers and we checked the inside of them. Uh, we have, uh, we should uh, worry in the big picture about the abstractions. The abstraction helps us deal with the complexity, so we don't have to get stuck with uh, details. Uh, uh, we would know, we should know about any processor, what's the instructions that architecture, or what is its ISA? What is the list of instructions that could uh, uh, program this hardware or uh, that the, this hardware could understand. It's actually the uh, what's hold the hardware, hardware and the software together. Together. So if you imagine that uh, the system is a sandwich, you will have the left and uh, uh, right breads. This is the hardware and the software, and in between we have the eyes. There are many examples of different eyes. We have uh, the MIPS. This is the MIPS ISA that we are going to study in this course. Uh, we have Spark, Bower PC, HP, PA, Alpha, Intel x86. This is probably one of the famous ones that probably you hear the, about before you uh, get enrolled in this uh, class. Uh, we have the IBM system 390, IBM AS400, and many, many, many other examples. In this course, we will study one of them, which is the MIPS. And it's very uh, efficient, easy to understand, in my opinion. Uh, we also have application binary inter interface, which is the API. It's actually the ISA plus the system software interface. And this is why we focus on the ISA. If you understand the ISA, the other ones would be absolutely OK. Uh, the implementation, which is the machine organization, where our, uh, we should know the hardware that obey the architecture abstraction, uh, how the partitioning into units and logic design uh, is performed in the hardware. Uh, some examples of different machine organization we have Intel uh, 386 CPU, Intel 486 CPU. These are all CPUs. We have Pentium processor. They are all Intel. Pentium 2, Alpha, this model, Alpha, another model, Alpha, another model. We have what we saw in Apple A5. D we have different organizations of the system. So uh, picking one of the Intel, let's pick one of B Pentium 2 processor. That's an old processor. Uh, the, the current ones uh, uh, that we have when I'm uh, recording this video, we have i9, i7, Intel processors. Uh, this understand the Intel x86 ISA. If you try to run any of the other ISAs or the instruction sets in a Pentium 2 processor, it won't understand. You cannot give command to the hardware to do a certain job. So uh, this is a hardware specific. 
uh, not only this, all of them actually. The ISA in general is uh, is hardware specific. Uh, uh, when we talk about the storage, the storage is a safe place for data. We should have uh, non volatile secondary memory that saves the, the uh, information even if the power is off. And when the power is on, we have the volatile main memory that's uh, faster than the non volatile one. And it could uh, work with level one, two, and three caches down to the register. So we have the volatile main memory, which loses the instruction and data when the power is off, when the power is off, and the non-volatile, which keeps it even if the power is off. Those non-volatile uh, secondary memory, some of the example, the magnetic disk, uh, the flash memory, and the optical disk. This is an optical disk. This is a, a, a flash memory. I, we opened the coffer and a coffer and you can see what's inside. And we have this uh, micro uh, chips that usually uh, you uh, have it inside mobile, for example. And we have this magnetic disk, which is the hard drive you can uh, see in the, in your machine, but we opened the uh, cover the metal cover on top of it to see what's inside. Uh, this is a warning. If you have a hard disk, don't open it. A dust particle could destroy your hard disk. But if you want to open an old one or something that is broken or uh, have uh, uh, unrecover unrecoverable, then you can take one and open it and check what's inside. For the networks, oh, it's needed for communication, resource sharing, uh, and uh, non-local access, meaning remote access. Uh, we have courses that teach uh, many ideas related to network, but as a breakdown, we have the local area network, LAN, uh, like uh, the ethernet or something internal in a building or in a company or even in a house. Uh, we have a wide area network, one, and that's uh, could, an example of, of it could be the internet. And we also have wired and wireless network. The wireless network, uh, it, it uses Wi-Fi or Bluetooth as protocol for communication. This is a, a wireless router, and this is a wireless router or switch, and you can see the cables uh, connected to it. This is a wired one. And this one is wireless. Now, the technology trends, uh, the electronic technology continues to evolve. It, uh, the, and this follows the uh, Moore's law. It has increased capacity and performance with the coming of years, which means since we have many parts, the prices of every individual part is going to be, to be cheaper every technology, every future technology. This is this uh, graph, you can see the years uh, starting from 1976 up to 2012, and we are trying to get the capacity, the capacity. You can see the, we have 16K, 64K, and then we get the capacity increased with the technologies in 2012, we have uh, the capacity uh, for gig. That's if we take the memory as example. So that's the DRAM capacity for gig at 2012 was good at this time. Now, uh, currently we are, uh, when I'm recording this video, we are in 2023 and we have 16 gig uh, memory. 232 gate memory, which is considered to be uh, excellent. So uh, each time you can see that we are doubling every uh, uh, techno technology generation, we are doubling the amount of the capacity. So we have one gig, and in the next generation, it becomes two gig, and X is four, and then we had eight, 16, and then 32, and so on. Uh, here's some history here. In 1951, the technology was 
vacuum tube that's very old. In 1965, the transistor, which has three terminals, were uh, three major terminals, were introduced. In 75, integrated circuit. 95, the VLSI, very large scale integration or integrated circuits. In 2013, the, the ultra large scale integrated circuit. And you can see the relative performance to cost uh, ratio. So here is one, 35, and at the end, it's like 250 billion. So uh, that's a lot of gain in performance compared to cost. Uh, the semiconductor technology, uh, some people call it semiconductor technology. Uh, it's based on the uh, element of silicon. Uh, you add materials to the silicon uh, to transform its property between uh, uh, insulators and conductors. The conductors, as you know, they conduct the current, the insulator. They don't allow the current to move uh, within them. The semiconductor is between the conductors and the insulators. So sometimes they pass the current, sometimes they don't, which will make them a good switch, like on and off. They pass sometimes the currents, they don't pass it in other uh, times. Uh, to manufacture any ICs, uh, let's say a processor, it goes through certain stages. So, uh, we get a silicon ingot uh, through a slicer. You get blank wafers. Uh, you had uh, about 20 to 40 processing steps to uh, uh, generate a patterned wafers from these blank wafers, where you can see that we have the mesh-like uh, shape in each of the wafer. Now we have, after that, the wafer tester, those wafers we already, for example, just to imagine it, each one of those uh, squares or boxes is going to be an uh, uh, Intel processor or Apple processor, ARM processor, or any kind of other processor. So we have as many processors in those uh, wafers. You can see that uh, here, the edges we are not going to include because they are not complete. We only cons uh, include the one that are uh, full boxes. We consider them to be full chips that that has uh, the processor. Uh, this is why after we get the uh, wafers this way, we test them. Some of the chips we cross them either they are in the edge on the edges or some of them, even though they are in the center, they are defective. So what happens after that, we have the dicer. The dicer make dices, as you can see. Those dices, you test them again, and any of them who are defected, you take them out, and uh, you bond the die to package. Basically, what you do in this step, you do the packaging. So you have the, now the processor in packaged already, uh, you, that you can plug into the uh, uh, motherboard. But before that, you do a BART tester. So you test it after you do the packaging, you test it again. And if any of them have defects or problems, you take them out. And after that, it's ready. You can put it in motherboards. You can construct your machine and ship it to customers. So basically, you have raw material. You make a lot of steps to generate the chips, and then you cut them down, batch them, and then ship them to the customer. But there are so many testing and verifying stages in between. The major point here is to increase the yield, which is the proportion of the working dies bare wafer. So you don't want to have a lot of defects. The less defects you have, the more yield you're going to have. Now, 
This is an Intel Core i7 wafer. You can see here that we have many, many, many uh, processor chips. This is a 300 millimeter wafer. It has 280 chips. Good luck counting them. And uh, it has 32 nanometer technology. That's the technology that you are using. And the 32 nanometer, what we mean by this is actually related to VLSI design. I will try to explain it quickly. If you have a transistor that looks like this, this is the gate. And we have two diffusion this way. Now, uh, if that's the source and this is the drain, uh, if you want this transistor to be off, there shouldn't be any connection between the source and the drain. If you want it to be on, then there should be some channel that connects the source and the drain. This channel, the length of this channel for this I core or Intel core I7 is 32 nanometer. Uh, each chip is 20.7 times 10.5 millimeter. Each one of these chip, which you can hold, I believe, with one thing. Now, the integrated circuit cost, it's actually a nonlinear relation. It has a nonlinear relation to the area and the defect rate. So if we say that we care about the wafer cost and the a area, uh, and we make them both fixed, and we have the defect rate, which is determined by the manufacturing process, how many defects we have. Uh, we have this quantified as the defect rate. We also have the die area, which determines by the architecture and the circuit design. For example, this one, this is the area of the chip or the die. Now, the cost per die is the full cost per wafer divided by how many dies I have per wafer times the so the yield is usually a percentage. Like for example, it's 90%. I have 90% yield, meaning that 10% is defect. Now, uh, this is what, what we want to get. What is the cost of every die? So we get the cost of the wafer. We see how many dies we have per wafer times their yield, and we have the ratio between the two. So now we want the cost per wafer. You should know it from the get-go. The cost is this much. Now, the dies per wafer, you could calculate it by knowing the area of the wafer and you divide it by the die area to get how many dies you have per wafer. The yield is a nonlinear uh, function of many uh, components. Basically, there are two. The first one is the defect. The second one is the area. So the yield is one over this amount that is squared, which is one plus the defects per area times the die area divided by two. This way, you get the yield. Once you get the yield, and the dies per wafer, you can plug them here, and you know the cost of the wafer from the beginning. So now you can get the cost per die. Here's an example. If you have the manufacturing uh, of a wafer that costs uh, 1500, and you know that the number of defects for every centimeter square is 2.5, the wafer radius is 10 centimeters. Notice the units. This is centimeters. This is also centimeters squared. So they are matched. 
let's say in case, the first case, case A, we have the dies are that are one centimeter by one centimeter. This is the area. That's the first case. The second case, we have the dies bigger, two centimeters times two centimeters. So in the first, the die area is one centimeter squared. You multiply those two. The dies bare wafer, you should get from this equation, the dies bare wafer, you should get the wafer area. Now we know that the wafer area is circular. So we get by R squared, we know how many uh, or what is the radius? So we get this easily. Now the die area, we know that it's one centimeter squared. So now we have 3.14, that's the bar, times 10 squares, date, that's the radius of the wafer, divided by the die area, which is one, that's 314. So uh, usually because there is a division, you will have some fraction. You take the fraction out, you only include the integer because you want to know how many dies per wafer. Doesn't mean anything if you have half a die. Now, the yield is one, you calculate what we've said here. This is a nonlinear uh, equation. Uh, you should get the defects per area. And that's the number of defects per area, which is the 2.5. We plugged it here. And we know they also, they uh, die area divided by two. So we have the one and it's divided by two but because we multiplied by half over here. And you calculate the yield and you notice that the yield is 0 0.198, which is 19.8%. Uh, That's uh, uh, the yield that we have in this uh, case, uh, this yield is pretty low. You should get the yield very high, maybe above 85% if you want to have a successful uh, company. Now the cost per die, which the amount that we want to get, what is the cost for every die? So it's the cost per wafer divided by the dies per wafer times the yield. The cost per wafer, we said that it's 1,500. The dies per wafer, we got them here, and we found that they are 314, and the yield is 0.198. So this means that every die will cost me 24 uh, point something uh, dollars. So let's say that it's 24.13 dollars uh you add that to that your uh profit margin to sell it to customer what if we have the dice bigger two centimeters by two centimeters we recalculate everything the die head is four centimeters square the die bear river is 78 and this is logical because now we have a certain wafer radius if we have small dies we will have many of the dies if we have bigger dies then for sure we will have less number of them so we got 78 in this case the yield when we calculate it we found that it's even worse it's only 2.78 percent that's really unacceptable however when we calculated the cost per die we found that it's going to be uh, uh, a whopping six hundred ninety-one point uh, seventy-five dollar. This means that going from the, the having those two choices and going from one centimeter times one centimeter to two to two centimeter times two centimeters dies. That's a bad decision. And the basic reason for this is we have a very low. Yield. We have a very low, low yield, which makes this value uh, in the denominator uh, small. And because they are smaller, the cost per die is going to be higher. 
Uh, notice that this is the cost. If you want to sell this to customers, you have to add your also, you add your profit margin to this cost, and then you sell it. Uh, at this point, we reach to one of the very important uh, aspects of this chapter, which is the performance. But we will leave this to the next video.